Good afternoon, and welcome to the Jewish Policy Center webinar. I am Shoshana Bryan, Senior Director of the JPC and your host. I hope you all had an excellent Thanksgiving holiday and Chag Hanukkah Sameach to those who are lighting candles this week. We have a very large audience today, which as you know, makes me very happy. I know that many of you are here because you've heard and read our guest today, Dr. Stephen Bryan, possibly in our Insight series of articles, possibly in In Focus Quarterly. He is, by the way, uh, in the upcoming winter issue of In Focus. Before we go to our program on Israel's aerial defense capabilities and what those mean, not only for Israel, but for its allies, including the United States, uh, here is your JPC commercial. The JPC was established in 1985 as a 501c3 organization providing analysis of foreign and domestic policies. That's policies, not politics. Our website is jewishpolicycenter.org, all spelled out, jewishpolicycenter.org. There you can read our Insight articles in Focus Quarterly, our blog In Context, or you can read our Alliance Tracker and Frontline Defense blogs. There is a lot of good information. I strongly recommend that you go to the website. The JPC supports a strong American defense capability, US-Israel security cooperation, and missile defense. We support the legitimacy and security of Israel against anyone who would deny them. As an organization that sits slightly to the right of center, the JPC advocates for small government, low taxes, free trade, fiscal responsibility, and energy security, as well as free speech and intellectual diversity. In this series of calls, we've been very pleased to bring you scholars and policymakers on issues, including China in various permutations, Israel issues, including but not only the Abraham Accords, Iran sanctions, and some domestic policies as well. Today, we're going to talk about a more limited but no less important element of 21st century conflict, technology, and specifically how Israel's new Scorpius electronic warfare system can change the battlefield for Israel and for Israel's friends. Our speaker, as I mentioned, is Dr. Stephen Bryan, who was the founder and first director of the Defense Technology Security Agency during the Reagan administration, where he was also Deputy Undersecretary of Defense for Trade Security Policy. Prior to that, he was a Senior Staff Director on the Senate Foreign Relations Committee, Executive Director of a grassroots political organization, and Director of JINSA. Post-government, Steve was President of Fin Mechanica North America and a Commissioner of the US-China Security Review Commission. He's written for a great many publications, including Epic Times, Asia Times, Washington Times, Newsweek, American Thinker, and here for the JPC, which is an excuse to tell you again that you can go to our website at www.jewishpolicycenter.org. Um, he has published six books on technology uh, and security subjects, including Technology, Security, and National Power, and his latest book, Security for Holy Places, and he has contributed to a number of studies on national defense and security. Uh, now your public service announcement, you are muted. That's it, that's your public <laughs> service announcement, you are muted. You can send your questions during the presentation by using the Q&A function on the Zoom screen and I will be monitoring. And Dr. Stephen Ryan, the floor is yours. Thanks Shoshana, am I muted or not? <laughs> uh, I'm going to give a presentation, I'm going to use some slides today. So I'm going to switch to that in just a second. Um, but by way of preface, uh, Israel today has one of the best air defense systems in the world. And we're going to take a little look at that, a little bit of a look at the challenges facing Israel and some of the new systems. And we'll, we'll end up, I, I hope, uh, uh, looking at the latest electronic defense system, uh, which I think is very revolutionary. So let me go with the screen. I hope I'm gonna do this. And give me one second to share the screen. There we go. Um, and let's start with the uh, slide one. If I, I have to see how I can move this along. There we go. Recently, Israel held what's called a blue flag exercise. It, well, actually it was the fifth one they've held and the most well attended. Uh, what this is, is a chance for air forces from around the world, in fact, 
to get together and to learn from each other, largely to learn new tactics, uh, new technologies, uh, new ways to address threats. Uh, the number of countries uh, attended, the Americans, of course, the French, the Italians, the Germans, the Greeks, all from NATO, but also uh, observers from many countries, Japan, Romania, Finland, the Netherlands, Australia, South Korea, and Croatia, uh, and also for the first time, the UAE uh, sent uh, its senior, most senior Air Force man uh, to, to the blue flag exercise. Also, although not announced, Jordan attended. And I'm not sure, and no one has said whether or not Egypt was there, but I suspect they may have been as well. Uh, so it was a very important uh, show. It lasted about five days. And it featured, of course, the latest uh, air defenses and the latest jets, like the F-35 Stealth, which is called Adir in Israel, which Israel has, which the Italians have, which the U.S. has. The U.S. didn't bring any to the show, but the Italians did, and the Israelis had their, theirs there as well. And, and some of the non-US systems were there, like the Mirage from France and the Eurofighter from uh, uh, Germany and the UK. But in a sense, the real star of the show was Israel's new uh, electronic defense system called Scorpius, which is described as what's called a soft kill system. A hard kill system is something that kinetically attacks a target and destroys it, whether it's a missile or an aircraft or a drone or a cruise missile, doesn't matter. It's still a hard kill. It's going to smash it in one way or another. Soft kill is a different story. It goes after the electronics and the sensors of the incoming threat and, and blocks those and essentially destroys the target through a soft kill mechanism. Now, if I can figure out how to make it go to the next slide, whoop, too many. Israel, as you know, has a terrific air force. Uh, it has uh, its own uh, cruise missiles, its own drones, which are very effective. Uh, just take a look at what happened in the Gorno Karabakh to see just how effective they are. And it has a very sophisticated layered air defense system made up of air iron dome, which you know about, which is used mostly against uh, rockets coming from Gaza. The David Sling, which is the system that replaces the U.S. Patriot and the U.S. Uh, uh, other U.S. Uh, missile systems, Arrow 2 and Arrow 3. And now there's an effort to build Arrow 4, which is to deal with hypersonic threats. Israel also has a nuclear triad, although it uh, absolutely denies it has nuclear weapons, uh, but it does. And, and this consists of, of missiles, particularly intermediate range missiles of Jericho 1, 2, and 3. Uh, nuclear cruise missiles like the Popeye, and nuclear-capable aircrafts like F-4 and F-15s. And, and to put together the, the air defense, the missile defenses, and the nuclear triad, Israel has a pretty strong deterrent as a country. Now, one of the tricks of all this is being able to integrate all these systems so they work, they work together. Uh, one of the weaknesses in the US system as, it's, as it exists today is the lack of integration. It's one of the things that the US has to work on, but it also has to work on ground-based air defenses, which right now we have very little in the way of, and also sea-based air defenses, which will be very important to US efforts in the Pacific region. Now, the, the threat is mostly coming from two sources or almost one source, which is Iran, whether it's Iran from Iran or whether it's Iran from its proxies in Gaza and Hamas and in, and in Lebanon and Syria, Hezbollah. Uh, and, and most of the threat is missiles, although we also see uh, other kinds of weapons, cruise, cruise missiles and, and UAVs uh, showing up into the picture. Now, most importantly, Iran has uh, long range ballistic missiles, including ICBMs now. Uh, which it got from the North Koreans and some technology from China and Russia. Uh, and, and it has also demonstrated that it can fly long range operations without the need for a man in the loop. This is very important because today, uh, if you take a UAV, usually you control it from a, a, a control center remotely. 
and you're communicating with it through either a satellite or through direct radio communications to send it to its target and to hit the target. So one of the opportunities for disrupting that kind of operation is to kill off the radio communications. And, and, and this is uh, something that's been done. And, and in other words, to take the man out of the loop and, and uh, essentially uh, change the equation. This was shown by the Iranians in the attack at Abkhik and Koreas uh, last year. This is a, a, an overhead satellite photo of the, the Abkhik uh, field where 17 different points of impact are recorded from Iranian cruise missiles and Iranian drones. But the most important in this were the drones. And let me show you, take a look at the, at the uh, down in the bottom, I don't know if you can see my pointer, but I'll do this and I'll show you four uh, storage tanks. And notice that the holes in the four storage tanks are all pretty much in exactly the same place. Now, this is a pretty amazing thing because these UAVs that hit these storage tanks were far outside of the, the communications range of Iran's, of Iran's uh, uh, radios. So how did they do it? And, and the way they did it was to use, uh, excuse me, was to use precision guided weapons that had scene matching capabilities that could operate autonomously without the man in the loop. And this is the new threat that's rising in the Middle East. And it not only threatens Israel, uh, it threatens Saudi, obviously, and UAE and others, because the Iranians can extend the range of their UAVs very easily and make it very hard to take them out. And, and, and that is, I think, the challenge from the UAV and the cruise missile side of the equation. The other challenge, of course, is Iran's long-range ballistic missiles that came from, that came from uh, uh, the North Koreans originally but they're now built in area. And this is the Shahab-3, which has sufficient range to hit Israel, uh, also other countries like Romania or Bulgaria or Greece, but the real target is Israel. And, and, and these are, are, are high-speed ballistic missiles that can be launched from Iranian territory. Uh, they are also increasingly equipped with new types of warheads. Now, these are three warheads that belong to that missile. The most interesting one is the new reentry vehicle on the on your right, which is uh, called uh, NRV. It has no real name. It, it's a triconic design. It's it's got three different dimensions, and it's designed to be very precise. And it also is designed to hold a nuclear weapon. And everyone believes correctly, I think, that Iran is is well on on the road to building nuclear weapons. Shahab-3 is likely the delivery vehicle for those nuclear weapons. And this re-entry vehicle is likely the one, the NRV, that will be uh, on the top of that missile. It's good enough that they, the Iranians, who alleged to have this, uh, developed it, and I'm not completely sure that's the case. I think it's Russian. But, but in any case, the Iranians have shared this technology with the North Koreans, also increasing the threat of a of a ballistic missile, nuclear missile strike from North Korea against its Korea itself or other targets, Japan, for example. And there are also, as you well know, many local threats. And, and uh, this, these are coming from Hezbollah, um, which has got thousands of missiles, uh, and, which is operating in Lebanon and Syria and from Gaza, which we're very familiar with. Now, I don't know if you can see it, but let me see if there's a way to move this image here. Yeah. Take note that over the last three years, Israel has been trying to remove as much as it can remove uh, the Syrian threat, which is the Hezbollah threat, by going after the missiles and UAVs uh, that the Iranians have delivered uh, to Hezbollah, either through Lebanon or directly through Syria. They have uh, fired 4,239 weapons against 955 targets. And as many as 70% of Israeli pilots have been involved in this campaign. It's a massive campaign, and it's very, very expensive, and not 100% foolproof. Um, 
you know, they keep at it and they will, every other day you'll see another report. But whether this alone is enough to stop the Hezbollah and the Iranians from threatening Israel is an interesting and open question. Um, and I think that, that even, uh, even with some of the most advanced weaponry, you know, Israel has cruise missiles like the Popeye and, and other newer ones, and, and it has bunker buster bombs and all the rest. But even with all this stuff, it's very, very difficult to clean out this threat. So part of the issue is, is, trying, to, uh, is to trying to find some answers. Let me just skip ahead a bit here. Uh, this picture, I think, tells you everything you might want to know about what the threat looks like. On the left, in the bottom left, you'll see uh, Israeli uh, Iron Dome missiles striking target, striking missiles that have been fired from Gaza. And on the right in the same image, you will see a whole lot of missiles being fired from Gaza that Iron Dome will have to take on. It's a tremendous challenge. It's an absolutely tremendous challenge. It's amazing that Iron Dome has knocked out more than 90% of, of threats that could hit legitimate targets in Israel. Well, the way Iron Dome works is that Iron Dome looks for those uh, rockets coming from Gaza that are likely to hit some sensitive target or a civilian population. And it goes after those. And the ones that it judges are going to land somewhere else, like in a farm field, it doesn't hit them because it doesn't need to. And that means it's kind of got a kind of economy that's important. But as more and more precision guided weapons show up in, 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 in Gaza and in, and in the north and in Syria. Uh, the problem gets worse because now you've got to hit them all. So it becomes very difficult to take on this kind of swarming threat. Now, that brings us to uh, the, the, how to deal with the threat. There are two ways. One is the kinetic way, which we talked about at the beginning. And the other is to use a soft kill approach. Now, the kinetic way is to use your air defenses, as Israel is doing. Primarily, most of the work has been with Iron Dome, because most of the, the threats have been coming from Gaza into Israeli territory and have been shot down by Iron Dome. But the other systems, the layered ones, are all designed to enhance uh, capabilities against bigger threats like intermediate range ballistic missiles like cruise missiles and so on. The, the difficulty is that this becomes, a, a very, uh, let me just go ahead, this becomes a very expensive proposition because the cost of each of these interceptor missiles can range from maybe $100,000 to as much as four or five million dollars. And when you think about in one afternoon, you can fire off millions of dollars of interceptors against cheap rockets. It's, it's a bad equation. It's a very bad equation. So nations have been looking for ways to do go to soft kill. That is just a way to intercept a, a rocket uh, so that you can soft kill it. Now, you can't soft kill the rockets coming from Gaza because they're not guided. They have no electronics. They're fired and aimed and they hope they will hit something, but they're, they're not likely to hit anything predictable, at least predictable from the Gaza side. They're predictable by computers that are watching them from the Israeli side using radars to plot their path. But you can't use soft kill against them. But once you get into the precision guided weapons that have sensors that look for targets, you can jam them, or at least you can potentially jam them. And that's the soft kill piece. And increasingly, as these weapons become more sophisticated, whether it's a ballistic missile, cruise missile, or UAV, the fact of the matter is that soft kill becomes more and more important. Now, the US has, generally speaking, always had jammers on fighter aircraft, and the Israelis have that too. But these are kind of old fashioned, and they're not very good, good because they don't have very long range, and because uh, they don't always work. So you have two double problem. But more recently, the Russians and Israel both have been looking towards something more sophisticated. Uh, the Russians have a system called Krakushka, which translates out as Belladonna, a beautiful woman. Also, that's a drug. 
<laughs> I don't know if they intend it that way. Um, it's it's a it's a jamming system, a very effective one, but it's a broadband jammer. It, it covers it, blankets an entire area, and tries to destroy what's coming in. Uh, it was used in the Nagorno-Karabakh conflict. It was used to, uh, in attacks, uh, attacks, basically drone attacks in Syria, and it worked fairly well from what we can tell. Of course, we're dealing with Russian stories, and you always have to discount those some to a certain extent. But Krakusha is the best thing the Russians have. It's mobile. It can be moved around. But it's not going to do much against a sophisticated threat that has uh, very good sensors and very good electronics. Uh, that, by the way, this is Krakushka on your left that you're seeing. And on your right, you, you're looking at a Turkish drone that was downed by Krakushka in Nagorno-Karabakh. Uh, take note that it didn't burn, it just crashed. Now, the Israelis were looking for, for something better, something that could, that could be more effective. And at the blue flag ex exercise uh, where we started, uh, the Israelis showed off a part of the Scorpius system. The part they showed was the training part. Uh, but gave our, uh, our NATO allies and friendly countries a chance to get a look at something that was uh, entirely new. Here's a photo of what, or I think is more of an image, of what the Israeli system looks like. It's quite simple looking, but very effective. Uh, it comes in different mo modes. The one you just looked at before was the land version. There's also a version that can be put on an aircraft. It can be a fighter aircraft, but it could also be a larger aircraft like a transport that could carry it. Uh, and then there's a sea-based version that is basically the land version mounted on the ship uh, and a training version, the T version, which you, uh, you already heard about. So it comes in different flavors. What's it do? Well, first of all, what it does is it uses a, a, an advanced technology called an electronically scanned array radar, and it uses it in two ways. AESA radar is the latest kind of radar that exists. It's, it's a flat radar. It doesn't turn or move. Uh, it's electronically steered. Uh, and it has the ability to pump out a lot of power, precise power, if you need it. In the case of uh, Scorpius, it does two things. First of all, it does a wide area search. So it can look all around to see what the threat is and to go after the threats that are most immediate and that need to be knocked out. It's soft kill, as I said. But the second thing it does is, a, is the radar also can pinpoint the target, not just blank out an entire area, but pinpoint the precise target, which vastly increases its range and gives you a chance to really aim at a specific target that matters and to deal with it. And, and that's something new. No other jammer has had that capability in the past to do the wide range search, but then to pinpoint. And more than that, it can do multiple targets at one time, which means it's, it's an effective soft kill mechanism against swarming attacks like that picture I showed you where all those rockets were coming in from, from Gaza. Um, so it's a very exciting development, I think. Um, it, it is probably impossible to jam because of the type of radar that it has. Uh, it has quite long range. It can go up against a, a wide range of threats, missiles, cruise missiles, UAVs, all of them, uh, and, and rockets of different kinds if they have electronics. So it's not going to do much against Gaza, but Iron Dome is there to take care of that issue. But it's going to do a lot against uh, swarming threats with precision guided weapons, which is the coming thing already in the Middle East today. So I, I think that this is, uh, the, I should mention one other thing while I'm, while I'm at it. Uh, another feature of uh, this jammer is it probably can take out what are called beyond visual range missiles. The Chinese and the Russians and the US have all been working on beyond visual range air to air missiles. These are designed to shoot down an enemy uh, aircraft that could be 75 or 120 miles away. It's a long way. Uh, 
until now, the only way to do that was to get to, to, to identify the enemy and shoot him down before he shot you down. But with, uh, with the, this new system, it's possible to get these things flying in the air because they all use radars to hit their targets. And if you can take out the radars, you can eliminate that kind of air-to-air -air threat. And I think we, we have to watch that Iran specifically will soon be acquiring modern fighter aircraft, either from China or Russia or both. And they will have BVR capabilities. And so be able, being able to do that with an electronic capability is very significant. This soft kill system really is an important development. And I think it's going to have a big effect in NATO. It's going to have a big effect on our allies in the Pacific. And I think it's going to create a lot of excitement. So I think I, I will stop there, except to say that protecting a nation's airspace is, is extremely important, whether that airspace is Israeli or whether the airspace is Saudi or UAE or NATO or the US or Japanese or Taiwanese or Korea. All of it's important. And, and, and being able to get ahead of the curve with both hard kill and soft kill capabilities to counter that sort of threat is exceedingly important. So I think I'll stop there. I don't want to overload you with technology. I've been warned against it by someone I know pretty well. Uh, she's the one that introduced me. Um, and uh, But I'd be happy to entertain questions. Thank you for listening. Thank you. Um, I'm going to ask you to turn off your slide share. I'm working that problem. There we go. Excellent. So the first thing I'd like to say is thank you, because we are generally focused on the Iranian nuclear threat, and for very good reason, you really don't want the Iranian nuclear threat to get out in front of you. Um, but I think we also need to understand that in the region and also in the Pacific, um, there are other threats and those other threats need to be dealt with and Israel is dealing with them. So, so I think it's, um, it's very important. We have a number of questions and I've tried to funnel them into group questions. So the first one is about the exercise itself. The number of countries and the nature of the countries uh, looks like a great sign of increased acceptance of Israel in the region as a friend and an ally. First of all, first question, is there any other possible uh, way to look at that event except as increased acceptance of Israel? Second question, are the benefits of doing it mostly political or are there also uh, concrete tactical benefits? Uh, specifically, how does it increase deterrence? And specifically, how does the US benefit? So that's a sort of bunch of questions. Okay, I think, well, first of all, the exercise, I think it is, is a learning experience for all the participants um, where they can share tactical know-how, uh, share ideas on how to deal with different kinds of threats, evaluate each other's uh, operations to a certain extent. Uh, it obviously, from Israel's point of view, is very important for lots of reasons. I mean, it will certainly help their arms sales uh, because people will see things that they can't see elsewhere. But more than that, it will it will help them share information with uh, friends and allies. At, at some point, uh, Israel is going to have to operate uh, either with the U.S. or with NATO countries or, or even with uh, some of the Arab countries in dealing with the Iranian threat. Okay, um, question from Ali. Excuse me. The lights go out here periodically. Um, a question from a listener. Do China and Iran know enough about Scorpius yet to be, have begun to do something to counteract it? Or is this so new that perhaps the other guys aren't there yet? That's a good question. I mean, I don't know how you counteract it. This is the first point. So that would take some, uh, will take some considerable thought. Um, I don't know if you can counteract it. It's a, there is such a thing as ECCM, electronic counter countermeasures that are out there, uh, whether they work or not, who knows? But I, I don't think it matters. I mean, you, you have to field this kind of system because of the threat that's coming. And, and I think it will be many, many years before they, they, they could do anything about it. Uh, 
to what extent would you say the exercise and especially this display of uh, surface to air missiles and, and capabilities is meant to intimidate Iran? Um, and if it is meant to intimidate Iran, do you think it worked? <laughs> well, you have to ask the Iranians, honestly, to, to know whether they were intimidated or not, but they surely took notice. Um, I mean, the, the more it looks as if uh, friendly countries, Israel and its neighbors, are opposing the Iranians and doing it with concrete capabilities, military capabilities, the better off we are. Here's a philosophical question. Why is Israel so transparent about what it has for its defense? Well, it's not as transparent as, as it might appear because they haven't told us very much about uh, their new electronic defense capability. They've given us very uh, limited information, let's put it that way. Um, they haven't given away any secrets. So I think that uh, they're not so transparent. Um, but you know, the nature of the beast is that you have to you have to show your capabilities, or the other guys won't take you seriously. Okay. Uh, question: When I read reports of Israel attacking sites in Syria, a listener says it frequently includes a claim by Syria that they shot down some of Israel's missiles. Uh, do you think that's true? You think the Israelis really are shooting down Israeli missiles? You mean the Syrians are shooting down? Uh, Israel? Sorry, Syrians. Sir. Uh, do I think it's true? Uh, no, not especially. They, they make so many claims, it's hard to sort them out. There is a change. I mean, everyone's talked about it. I think it's true that it's now more difficult to fly uh, close to uh, Syrian and Russian air defenses in Syria. So they're relying more on long range weapons like cruise missiles to knock out targets, which raises the cost because instead of a, a an iron bomb, even a guided iron bomb, you have to use a very much more expensive cruise missile. So we have two questions here, I'll fold them together, about retaliation. Um, the first one is, what about massive retaliation? Can Israel make the cost of an enemy attack unacceptable? And secondly, um, is Israel going to be left with no choice at some point? other than to take out Iran's nuclear capabilities in order to protect itself from all of these things? I think there are two different things. Um, the, first, the first, if I understand the questions right, the, the first question is, you know, is it costly to the enemy, so to speak, to keep whacking at Israel? And uh, it's not. I mean, the, the missiles that have been, and rockets that have been fired from Gaza are cheap, uh, crudely made. Now, as they raise the sophistication of those weapons, the price will go up. But it's asymmetrical in the sense that it's much more costly to shoot them down than it is to make them. So that's the first thing. In regard to the bigger question that's buried here, or not buried so much, but the lurking, uh, the Iranian threat. Uh, this is, a, this is a, an existential issue because the, the real truth is that at some point, Israel will have to decide whether to go get rid of the Iranian threat before it be, get, becomes worse uh, and, and we're in intractable and where they can't stop it. So th that's a tough decision. That's one that we're edging toward all the time. The Iranians are edging to, I, I, I have to say that, you know, the more Iran plays with building nuclear weapons, the bigger the risk to Iran of getting hit. I mean, there's a point you get to where you can't accept it. And I think that's, where we're creeping toward at a high rate of speed. So that's, something I've wondered, <laughs> that's something I've wondered about all along. How long do you watch somebody build a capability that threatens you before you decide to take it out? I mean, there was, if you look at the run up to World War II, everybody knew where Hitler was going physically. They knew where he was going. They knew what he wanted and they watched him do it. And at some point it became untenable. You couldn't watch him do it anymore. You had to get rid of him. Doesn't that happen in the region here as well? The Hezbollah buildup of uh, missiles and rockets, the Hamas buildup of missiles and rockets, and the Iranian conventional as well as nuclear buildup. At some point, doesn't somebody have to take that on? Not after they hit you, but before they hit you. Well, I think that's what, you know, what the Israelis are telling the, the U.S. and the Biden administration right now, uh, reaching a point of no return. 
the analogy to Europe is a little bit different because the Europeans weren't prepared. And, uh, and, and so they were trying to hold off getting into a conflict because they knew they would probably lose and, and they were right. <laughs> they were going to lose. And they lost an awful lot of, of, of territory because of uh, their lack of preparedness. Israel is a much more better prepared country. So I think that, that it's apples and oranges in a way. Well, that's it's good to know because we don't want World War II in the Middle East. Um, back to this concept of Israel participating in multinational um, exercises and training sessions. As Israel extends military cooperation and sales to places like the UAE and Morocco and others, how does it defend against potential changes in the relationships? It happened with Turkey. There was a great relationship between Israel and Turkey. Um, and now there isn't one. Do you compromise your assets by sharing them? Well, there's always risk involved in sharing technology. There's no way to minimize that completely. There are ways to protect certain things. You can protect designs. You can protect software to some extent. You can do some things. But at the end of the day, you take a risk when you sell uh, uh, weapons to others, uh, even countries that are not likely to flip. I mean, Israel sells a great deal of equipment to, to India. Uh, in fact, it's, it's probably their best customer. But keep in mind the fact that India also cooperates very closely with Russia. So does it, does it leak? Yeah, sure it leaks. But I guess the Israelis have figured they're willing to take that chance. Um, a, a listener writes, Chinese and Russian hypersonic missiles, Israeli and Russian soft kill weapons. Is the United States falling behind technologically? And if so, where should we be putting our focus? Well, we are falling behind on hypersonic. I mean, the administration has admitted that. And we're way behind. Uh, we're also really way behind on defenses against hypersonic threats. And, and I think that that's where the soft kill capability the Israelis have developed could prove to be remarkably important in future, because I don't, it, it won't distinguish one way or another between hy hypersonic and non-hypersonic. Hypersonic, by the way, is five times or more the speed of sound. And, and that's about uh, 3,800, I wrote it down, 3,805 miles at five times. Uh, and then he goes up to around 7,000 miles. That's very fast. But electronics faster than that. So soft kill capabilities turn out to be a really important way that you could go after a hypersonic threat that you're not going to get with a kinetic kill because the kinetic kill is going to be too slow to catch up with the threat. Um, and you're going to be too slow in launching. So th this is a very interesting. I think the Israelis are onto something. I think the US knows it. Uh, the cooperation between Israel and the U.S. in ballistic missile defense is exceptionally strong. And I, I imagine it's going to now include the, the soft kill capability. It has to, because this has got to be part of our response. Uh, the U.S. is falling behind not only in hypersonics, but the air defenses were very weak. We have a lot of work to do in this country to protect ourselves in future. That's a scary thought. There's a history question for you. Um, <laughs> Is it was, a quiz? <laughs> well, you were there. Um, no, okay. Was the Levy in the 1980s a missed opportunity for the Israel Air Force? Um, the prototypes that were considered are now considered to have been superior to the F-16s, but there were uh, problems. So was it a missed opportunity? Well, I mean, I think the problem with Levy was mostly industrial base and costs. It would require a huge industrial base in Israel to support it. And the cost of the levy, the real cost, not just the, the unit cost, but the R&D costs were really staggering. And I was involved in it in the Pentagon at the time. And it was, you know, the Pentagon was willing in those days, and this was um, during the Reagan administration, was willing to sell the technology that Israel wanted for the levy. There was no restrictions on that. But the Pentagon said, you know, have you looked at what the price tag is for this thing? I mean, there were people in Israel, particularly Moshe Aarons, who were huge proponents of, of uh, La Vie. La Vie was sort of like the same thing the Swedes have today called the Griffin. 
it, it, it's a it's a good it was a good fourth generation airplane but today we're talking about fifth generation airplanes and stealth and all kinds of long range missiles which was not Levy's game so i think israel would have been stuck with a turkey at the end of the day because of the costs and, and because of the burden those costs would impose and the us wasn't going to pay the whole bill so a related question um were the F-35s worth the investment, uh, given their cost and some of the problems that we've seen with them? Israel was not thrilled to be purchasing the F-35 when they right. agreed to do it. I, I imagine, and I imagine, because I don't know for sure, that the Israelis see the F-35 as a penetration air superiority weapon against Iran that could be used to take out Iranian missile defenses and Iranian aircraft prelude to a major attack with fourth generation aircraft against Iranian its installation nuclear installations and missiles and missile fields you know missile sites so in that sense it looks like a very good acquisition now is it that good we don't know nobody here knows I mean I don't know maybe the Pentagon thinks it knows but you have to ask them but I don't know but I mean, I think it has pluses and minuses, but I think on the whole, right now, it's the best Israel could get to deal with that kind of threat. And again, in a kind of philosophical way, a related question. We look at uh, China and Russia and Iran, and they seem to have all of these capabilities, some of which we don't have, but they do seem to happen. Um, do they really have the capabilities that they appear to have? We discovered after the Cold War that some of what Russia claim to have was actually not real. How do we know, how do we figure what's real and what isn't when you look at an enemy arsenal? Well, we know they built hard uh, silos for their missiles and underground storage. And they put a lot of their nuclear program underground, which makes it hard to get, hard to hit. Um, and, it, it, you know, that they have. I mean, they can't get away from that. When you get further beyond that, like the Iranian uh, Air Force or the Iranian Navy, it isn't much. And the Iranian Army, I don't think, amounts to anything. But, you know, they, they're very, they have a lot of big pretensions and they, they churn out a lot of weapons. How many of them really work very well? The way they look at it, I think, is they don't have to work really very well. They just have to work adequately. So they can shoot missiles at Saudi Arabia or the UAE or give Hezbollah stuff to fire at Israel. It's a, you know, it's cheap war from their point of view. So um, that's as philosophical as I get. Well, I don't know. I'm going to give you another sort of you, you've um, prompted all these kind of philosophical questions. I don't know if it's because people are afraid of of hardware questions, but you've prompted a bunch of philosophical questions. France, as a member of um, the Western Alliance, was at this exercise. And the question here is, is France truly an ally of Israel? Are we, are we allowing France into something? And then the French, you know, they're not very good. Well, France is part of NATO. And, and NATO is, you know, NATO is very friendly to Israel because it benefits a lot from Israel. Um, is NATO going to come and defend Israel? No, I don't think so. But it, but NATO still is very reliant on a lot of Israeli technology and know-how and combat experience, which they don't have. So, uh, you know, it's it's extremely important. I, I, I know that you've written about, and, and quite rightly, that moving uh, Israel from the NATO family to the, to the UCOM, to the CENTCOM, the Central Command, which is more of the Middle East, uh, sort of tried to take it, not on purpose, I don't think, but took Israel out of the NATO equation. But now I think the Israelis have made it clear they want to stay in those relationships. A lot of the NATO folks, the big ones, showed up uh, at the exercise. They buy a lot of stuff from Israel. Israel benefits a lot from its connection to NATO. And NATO benefits a lot from what the Israelis know about the threat. So even though the Europeans have this unpleasant tendency to 
vote against Israel in the UN and unpleasant, unpleasant generally Israel. speaking. They're I'm unpleasant not... generally. I hope they're. I hope they don't have too <laughs> many NATO listening. allies on this on this call. But um, so, despite their kind of political tendency to criticize Israel and demand things of Israel and not be very friendly to Israel, when it comes right down to security issues and absolute mechanisms for the defense of Europe and the defense of Israel, would you say they've got a different relationship? Absolutely. Relationship? Absolutely. I mean, the, the defense relationship is very strong. And, you know, they show up because they want to learn and because they want to participate and because uh, they, uh, they, they want to get the best for themselves out of the relationship. It's a very, you know, the military to military relationship with the Europeans is generally excellent between Israel and the Europeans. So that's, so, what I, that, that's I think, very important. So this is going to bring us to our last question. And people who listen know that I always like the last question to have a positive answer, because I know people are going to have lunch after this, and you need to go on a positive note. So <laughs> stemming right from that last question about Europeans whose defense relationships are certainly better than their, mili the, uh, their political relationships uh, with the Europeans, here's a question that was, um, sent by someone. What leverage does the US have over furnishing supplies, repair and parts, et cetera, to the Israel Air Force? And are there substitutes for US supplies if Washington conditions its support on Israel adopting policies that it views as inimical to its own interests? And added to that, would you say that the defense relationship again may be differently constructed than a political relationship? I think the evidence shows that the defense relationship between the US and Israel is very, very strong. It's unlikely to be disrupted. There was once a pause in the 80s, you remember, uh, when, the, when the US did a reassessment. Uh, the reassessment didn't lead to anything. There were other, other incidents. Obama cut off sales of uh, Hellfire missiles to Israel. So Israel made its own. With a spike, put a spike on helicopters and said the hell with hellfire. I guess that makes sense. Uh, so, I mean, you know, there have been bumps on the road, but I don't think as a practical matter that it's in either the US interest or Israel's interest or anybody's interest for that relationship to be broken. Israel's really crucial to US security in the Middle East. It's, it's the backbone of it. Without it, the US is not there. We have a couple of thousand troops in Iraq and that's it. I mean, what are we talking about here? We have a couple thousand in, in UAE and Qatar and in Saudi. But I mean, bottom line is the U.S. needs Israel. Israel needs the U.S. So I, I'm very optimistic about the relationship. That's the note I wanted to end on. So <laughs> good. A positive now you can note. have lunch. <laughs> now we can have lunch. So Stephen Bryan, I want to thank you on behalf of the listeners today and all the members of the Jewish Policy Center for bringing us a part of the defense and security of Israel that I think sometimes uh, we neglect. Thank you very much. My pleasure.